more corporations are opening the eyes to the power of design thinking as a way to solve the crisis of innovation. But misguided efforts, however well-intentioned, may do more harm than good. The truth is, design thinking has become broken in today's digital age. Yes, true, true success comes from building a complete design system, and no organization can build such a, a system on design thinking alone. Our next keynote is entitled Design Thinking, how to use it and why it's not enough. And it will be presented by a serial entrepreneur and innovator who has worked in the media, media, digital, mobile, and design for 30 years. In 2001, he co-founded the service design consultant Fjord that was acquired by Accenture in 2013, and now he's the chief client officer there. He has said, we are going to see more changes in the next five years than we've seen in the last 20. Maybe he will tell us why. Let's please welcome Mark Curtis. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you for having me here in Madrid to talk today. It's a privilege to be here and, and talk about some of the things we're thinking about, about what's happening in design and where it's going next. Um, so design has been around for a while. It's, it's not a new thing. Humans have used design for a long time. They've used it to reflect on who they are and to think about the world around them and, and to make sense of the world around them. Um, there it is. And, um, and, and actually used it, of course, to, to work to create tools uh, which are valuable for us. Um, moving on from that, design gradually became something which has become hugely important to the creation of culture. So when you look at the Colosseum, there are details on the Colosseum which simply don't need to be there. They're there because actually they're an expression of culture, they're an expression of what it means to be a human being. Um, a Mustang doesn't need to look like that, uh, but it does, and it, we all look at that picture and we know roughly when it's from, we, we immediately begin to intuit something about the culture that developed that particular design. So I want to talk about three key things um, that have gone into design over the ages. The first two are people and technology. So design has always been about us and about technology. Um, and and, and with, with tools created in order to go hunting, what in effect is happening is it's a very, we don't think of this as technology now, but actually it is a technology, um, and we can dig it up now and we can have a look at what Stone Age Man did in order to create those tools. And then moving on a bit, uh, we began to use very serious bits of technology to create things like the pyramids. The pyramids were also all about people because they were an expression of um, power. So design has always been about people and technology, more recently, the organization is the third thing to add to the people and technology, and that's because the industrial age um, made, made organizations central to what we do, and, and, and designing that organization and designing the way in which factories worked became um, very important to us. So design, I think, at that stage took a leap forward. So let's dive into each of these, human, technology, and organizations, and think about, when we're thinking about design, what, are the, what, what do we think of when we look at design through those lenses? So the first one is the human. So humans used to have a lot of time on their hands, but raw materials were very expensive. It was not easy for the pharaohs to create those pyramids, to, to carve out the stone, and then get thousands of people assembled in one place in order to, to build the pyramid, but, but comparatively, the people were cheap and the material was expensive. And the same thing with Baroque cathedrals. What you're looking at is something where the materials were actually very expensive, but the cost of having craftsmen who could carve those materials into elegant designs was actually comparatively relatively cheap. Now that's all flipped. The equation has changed. And when you look at a modern city like New York, what you get there is somewhere where um, the time of people is expensive, but comparatively, the materials are actually cheap, or we wouldn't see cities like that. And 
what we see now is that the most valuable design is a design that saves us time. It's why Amazon has been all-conquering. Because what Amazon does is it saves us time. Not only saves us time because it means we don't have to go to a retailer in order to get the goods that we want, but saves us time also conceptually as well. Because when you think, damn, the light bulb is broken and I need a new light bulb, you don't have to think very hard about where you're going to get it from. You go, if you want to, you can go straight to Amazon. In fact, of course, now you can go straight to an Echo device and speak to Alexa and say, Alexa, I need one of these new light bulbs, and, and it will appear a day later. So effectively, what is happening is that um, as human time has become more precious, which is why we no longer carve big buildings like we used to, or generally we don't carve big buildings, we get machines to do it. So the winning services are those which are saving us time and effort. Or they take human potential and they amplify it. So some of you will be probably familiar with this, and there's a lot of talk about what's happening in this space with artificial intelligence and medicine at the moment. But what seems to be emerging in that space is that when you put humans together with artificial intelligence, then the level of accuracy you get, whether it's radiology or, in this case, uh, pathology around, around cancer, around breast cancer, the level of accuracy you get is incredibly high. So what we're doing here is we're effectively using machines, which is what artificial intelligence, after all, is, to take something we already did pretty well and make it even better. And I think on another note, we'll see with artificial intelligence, we'll see that flipping around as well. We'll see us working with artificial intelligence to take something that it does very well and make it even better. So these, 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 um, this equation here, if you like, these ratios will definitely change between humans and AIs depend, and AI depending on, on, the, on the, um, the particular context. And then the last thing on people is that one of the things that makes it interesting and makes design perennially interesting when you're looking at it through the human lens is that people are messy. They don't behave in the way we expect they're going to do. It's, it's all very well writing um, user scenarios and, and user journeys and looking at user archetypes, and we do a lot of that, and we have to. It's part of our process, and it's very effective. But actually, when it comes down to it, people behave in ways which we don't expect, which is why economics notoriously struggles to predict what's really going to happen, because people are irrational and don't behave in the rational way which economics originally assumed that they would. So the second lens to look through is the lens of, of organization. So organizations have been, certainly in the 20th and 21st century, or 20th century, uh, have been using design in order to create efficiency and uniformity. So Raymond Lowe, uh, not only designed this toaster, but many others, uh, which created a very efficient way to create products which were actually rather beautiful to look at, and created, if you like, uniformity across American households in the 1940s and 1950s and beyond. Um, and in Italy, um, and in fact, the, the Cinquecento, which is this car here, was um, both the last car to be totally designed by one human being, the whole thing, top to bottom, but it was also a solution to a problem which was that in relatively poor post-war Italy, um, the standard forms of transport were um, two and three person uh, motorized um, motorbikes and, and, and scooters and, um, and bubble cars. And what um, Fiat managed to do was to bring motoring to the masses, which is why this car was so unbelievably successful. Um, but they did so in a way which was also by designing it um, to be produced efficiently, they were able to produce these cars in, in enormous quantities. But all of that is changing because digital, and it's really digital that has forced this, so the push for uniformity and efficiency, which is what a lot of the 20th century organizational history is about, that's now flipping completely. And what we're seeing is that people are using and wanting to use digital in order to personalize stuff around us as individuals rather than deliver uniformity. And, and this trend is clearly one of, the, one of the key trends that's happening out there. And that's then pushing um, a focus on, on the individual. And Klaus Schwab, who's the founder of the World Economic Forum, um, talks about uh, talentism as a replacement for capitalism. This is all about people, how we work collaboratively, which is a lot of what you hear when we talk about design thinking, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. Um, 
and, and a focus on, on the user. And this is a big, has been one of the big shifts brought about by digital over the last 20 years. And what we're also seeing is an enormous amount of use now of data, much more than we've ever seen before in, in the design of services. This is not new. Uh, Florence Nightingale, uh, who's a very famous character, person in, in, in British history, she's really the founder of modern nursing. Now, not many, and there's a, a very the legendary stories about her, that she was, she's called the Lady of the Lamp because she went to the Crimean War uh, in Russia and, um, and reinvented nursing there, and, and the soldiers would look at this woman with a lamp walking through the wards of the hospital late at night, and there are many stories about this. What is left out of most of those stories is that she was actually a data designer. Um, and what Florence Nightingale did is that she took a whole heap of data, and she tried to analyze why soldiers were not recovering from their wounds in the hospital. And using the data, she then created information graphics. You can find all of this on Google, and they're beautiful graphics. She created information graphics, which she then presented to the uh, crusty, uh, old-fashioned heads of the army. And she said, this is why the soldiers are not coming out of hospital. It's because you're not looking after them properly. And if we did the following things, we could actually have a, a much better and higher throughput of people through the hospitals and much higher levels of recovery. And she used information design and data in order to be able to do that. We're now seeing, of course, with digital, the mass availability of data for us to use this and to reinvent design, and organizations are pushing that. So the third lens to think about is the technology lens. Um, and, and we're seeing, of course, technology evolving very fast. Um, I, I keep being astounded by how the, 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 the lapse time between seeing something in a Hollywood movie and it becoming real is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and, and, you know, we used to see stuff in movies, um, like in Star Wars, and think, yeah, well, that's never going to happen in our lifetimes. But actually, there's numerous examples, robots being a very good example, of things that I sat in 1977, I think Star Wars came out, uh, maybe a little earlier, I sat in a big cinema and looked at this screen and thought, well, I'm never going to see that in my lifetime. And now we're seeing stuff beginning to appear. But that was some time ago now, and we're now seeing robots appear. If you take a movie like Her, which talks about a man, as you may have seen it, falling in love with, um, with, uh, with an artificial as uh, assistant, artificially intelligent enabled assistant, that film only came out about three years ago, and now we have Alexa. And if you don't believe me, a, fr a colleague of mine in America said that, told me recently that she had sent um, her father, who lived in another state, an Amazon Echo, uh, for a present. Um, he lives on his own. And she rang him up a couple of days later and said, how are you getting on with the Echo? And he paused, and then he said, I think I'm falling in love with Alexa. It's a 75-year-old man. Um, and, and I have another colleague in America whose son actually packed Google at home in the suitcase and took it on holiday with them because he didn't want to leave, quote, Google at home. So technology is evolving very, very fast. And we can see this when you look at the valuation of companies which have technology at the camera. I mean, this is a simply stunning chart when you begin to think about it. And look at the valuations uh, of, for example, if I draw your attention to the difference between the valuation of, say, Apple and ExxonMobil, a very old world company, uh, who are still just about in there in the top 10. I predict they won't be there very much longer, probably, if, if, if this trend continues in the direction that it's going. The problem here is that technology changes fast, but we don't. And I, if I left you with one thing today, this would be one of the essential things to, to get across, is that humans actually don't adapt very, very, very quickly. The technology is now moving faster than ever before, and that is accelerating. Uh, as the editor of The Economist said last year, the pace of change will never again be as slow as it is today. But that's for the technology, it's not for people. The critical role of design is to act as a translator to unlock that trapped value in the technology. It always has been, but that's become more critical than ever, which is why um, designers have become very hot in technology. And, and this is not just me saying it because I rah, 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 design is successful now. It's true, but if you actually look at the numbers and you look at the ratios of designers to developers, that is changing very quickly at some of the major technology companies across the world, and, and, it, and it's, it's continuing. That trend is accelerating. It makes our life harder, because it makes it harder and harder uh, to find 
um, top designers. Um, and the impact of design is growing as well. So a lot of design was really, if we think about um, you know, the, the Cinquecento and we think about the toaster, was, di was focused on B2C. Um, but then gradually, particularly in our business, what we've seen is a growth of, 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 um, in B2B. And most recently, it's been significant over the last two to three years, an enormous rise in the amount of work on business to employee. In fact, I would say that's something like 30 to 35% of the work we're doing at the moment. In fact, beyond that, what we're seeing is that you can't really do B2C, business to consumer, without considering business to employee at the same time. And we're typically developing both of those uh, on the same track at the same time. The next thing that's happening with design is that we're moving from a place where we were typically thinking about point solutions to one where we're thinking about systems. So to make that more alive for you, um, I can say with certainty that about 12 years ago, um, we were typically thinking about designing for a screen this big and a user who would be using a keyboard and a mouse. As soon as the iPhone came along, we had to start thinking about screens this big and then, of course, a variety of screens and thinking about touch, swipe, uh, all sorts of stuff. Now, we're actively designing for and thinking about voice and location um, as interaction paradigms and gesture as interaction paradigms. All of these are happening now. So if you think about that multiplication of screen sizes, in some cases, no screens at all, and interaction paradigms, all of which have to be tackled by anybody delivering a service right the way across the modern ecosystem, a bank, for example, or Spotify, for example, then you're in a world of much, much more complexity. I, I actually think one of the key things that design now does is to simplify complexity, and I think that task is getting harder as we go on. Design is also being done in very different ways now. So we've seen the rise of Agile over the last four to five years, and increasingly, design is not being done in a silo uh, in a design studio where you just have pure designers thinking, not talking to anyone else. It's actually being done in cross-functional teams, and this is undoubtedly uh, the, the way of the future. Um, and the people who buy design have changed as well. So again, when I think back to 12 years ago, we never met a CEO. They just simply were not interested in design. Um, that's all changed. And, 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 and now we're frequently being asked to talk with CEOs about, and, and I had a meeting about a year ago with, with one, uh, a telco in, in Europe, and it was the board, and I said, who's in charge of the user experience here? And the CEO put up his hand and said, it's me. Now, I'm not sure that was the right answer, but it was certainly good to hear that coming from, from the CEO. And arguments about who owns design and who owns experience are beginning to break out all over the place. Is it the chief digital officer? Is it the chief design officer? Is it chief experience officer? Is it the CIO? Um, these, these, these arguments are raging now. So what's coming next? There are, I think, some significant threats to design. Um, we get very anxious about the fact that the platforms that we're building for iOS, Android, etc., are straightjacketing design into what we would call bland sameness. And I think this is not just an aesthetic problem, it is also a problem of differentiation, and I actually think it's a human problem. I think we, if we kill off variety, we're not going to be in such a happy place. Uh, and, and the, the um, push towards speed which you see with um, the focus on Agile, for example, and there's nothing wrong with Agile, so I'm not knocking that process, but the, um, the push towards speed uh, threatens the loss of craft skills. And this is one of the problems I've got with design thinking, which is that people overuse this term design thinking and think, great, I can have a three-day course, I can become a design thinker, I've got it now, I understand about being user-focused, I understand about collaboration, I understand about working in a big way and having stickies on the wall all over the place, and, and I can do that design theater, as one of my colleagues calls it. But they forget that actually there's an enormous amount of craft that goes into really stunning design, and we need to be careful about not losing that. The second thing is, I've talked already about the complexity I talked about on the last slide, and I think that is um, a very big challenge and one which we're having to work very hard to stay on top of on a day-to-day -day basis, because when you add in voice and you add in gesture and you add in new interaction types and you add in artificial intelligence, we're clearly dealing with, with a world where you have to consider many more things when you're thinking about designing digital products. And lastly, this point that this belief that design can solve everything. So 
About a year ago, there was a uh, cover, front cover of Harvard Business Review, and it talked about design thinking. And it really scared the shit out of me. Because when you get something on the front cover of Harvard Business Review, it begins to look like a management fad. And we know what happens with management fads. Somebody will write an article on this in two years' time, and they will say, design thinking doesn't work. I've reviewed 100 companies that say they're using it, and we haven't seen any change in their share price, therefore design thinking doesn't work. Now, what worries me at that stage is we say, OK, design thinking doesn't work, throw design out. It's not important anymore. We don't need the chief design officer. We don't need design talking to CEOs. That was all a bit of a waste of time. We're not going to go there anymore. And I think that is a very real uh, existential threat to what we do, but I also believe, I hope, in my rapid presentation, that I've justified the reason why design is so incredibly important as the uh, glue that locks together people and technology and unlocks that trap value in technology. So, we need to stop focusing just on design thinking, and we need to look at the other two bits of this as well. Design doing, that's actually the craft. It's actually making the things and shipping them out into the marketplace, not just putting stickies on the wall. But on top of that, we also need to think about the design culture, and it's the one that most organizations are struggling with the most, which is, yes, we've got the design thinking stuff because we've read the books and done the courses, and we've seen the videos, but actually building that into an organization turns out to be very difficult. Um, I, I met with a team of ours working in a, a client building a little while ago, and I said, why does this not look like a design studio yet? And they said, the facilities man will not let us stick anything on the walls. I thought it was a really interesting anecdote, but I've heard this again and again. So what's happening there is that somebody working in a back office environment is not enabling a customer-focused design um, culture. And, and this, this outer circle is one we're focusing on a lot now, and I believe is one of the biggest challenges. So we see design taking um, a much more central role in, in what we do, because if you go back to what I said at the beginning, we saw this flip where people's time was, uh, was, 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 was not a scarce resource, it was an abundant resource, and that's what led to the building of the pyramids or the carving of Rococo or Baroque buildings, but now that's not the case anymore. People's time is the scarcest resource we've got, and design has to take an essential role to, uh, to unlock that resource. Pushing beyond that, what we're hearing very clearly now coming through is, a is, is the beginnings, and that this is really pushing into the future now, the beginnings of people saying, how can we design the ethics of companies? I think we saw a very major turning point this year when the board of CEOs walked out from Trump's uh, industrial boards en masse in June, I think it was. What happened there was that politics became something that they were involved in. Ethics became something they were involved in. And I don't think major corporations can go back from this. So we're going to see a lot more questions asked about how do we express the ethics of an organization through its design? Because the experience is where you experience the bundle of promises that an organization is making. So we see more CEOs and politicians coming from a design background and focusing more on things like privacy and truth and politics. Um, we'll see much more, I've already talked about this, multimodality, uh, particularly for living services, which is the generation of services which are now beginning to hit the market, uh, which change in real time around the customer. We're seeing a fusion of physical and digital. This is happening really right the way across the board now. If you look at the things that Disney are doing, the things that Carnival Corporation are doing with their cruise ships, they're now beginning to think about digital and physical as being one thing, and they're not making an artificial distinction between the two. But beyond all of that, we should continue to use design to dream about what we can be. Because that's, I think, where the magic is. And if we let go of the magic, it simply becomes a function. And we don't intend to let go of the magic. Thank you very much.